I'll refrain. Okay, um, my name is Dean Greaves, uh, I'm from the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, commonly known as IMECI. Is there anybody here? Uh, well, okay, we'll do it the other way around. Is there people here, or are there people here that know of IMECI? We'll just see a show of hands. Okay, all right. Excellent. All right, so I'll try and teach you not to suck eggs too much, okay? Now, I've only got about sort of 10 or 15 minutes for this presentation. Uh, it's fairly sort of short and sharp, and hopefully by the... It's kind of aimed a little bit at students as well, um, and what I'm going to try and do is give a general overview of what IMECI mm -hmm. is, what some of the benefits are, what some of the... the the way is to become registered, really, as well. And then after this, I'm going to hand over to Nick, who's from Bloodhound, which is probably a lot more of an exciting presentation. Um, but you've got me first. So, okay, uh, I'm a key. Everything you need to basically uh, have or to succeed at the home of mechanical engineering. So, what is I'm a key? Who are we? Uh, a little bit about who we are. Uh, it's not actually working on this screen, so I'll, I'll read it off this one as well. Um, so, representing and promoting the interests of engineering and, and, and engineers globally. Um, fastest growing engineering institution in the UK, we're not the biggest, but we're certainly the fastest growing. Um, licensed by the Engineering Council to essentially award three levels of professional registration. So we've got Eng Tech, we've got IEng, and we've got CEng. Uh, Eng Tech is Engineering Technician, IEng is Incorporated Engineer, and CNG is Chartered Engineer. Uh, and we also support all disciplines of the mechanical engineering community, which is quite important. Uh, provides learning and development support at every stage of your career. So it's not just at the beginning, it's not just in the middle, it's the whole way through. Okay. Um, keep it in touch. Uh, this is as, as it suggests, really, and what, and what this is for me uh, is basically a little reminder to point you uh, towards our website, which I'll, I'll be quite frank. Um, probably six months ago, if you tried to access the iMechi website, you could probably do that. Could you navigate it particularly well? I would suggest that you probably couldn't. Uh, it was a little bit wieldy. What we've done is we've put a lot of time uh, and money and, and, and investment into this, and it's now a, a very, very user-friendly website, I hope. I believe it is. Um, various sort of elements of social networking as well. This is always worth a look, again on the website you can view videos, forums, discussions, regular news and posts, and there's a whole host of, you, of useful links on there as well. So please, please, please just have a, a quick sort of five minutes and have a look and, and see what you think. Okay, um, we also, um, as, as, as the screen suggests, uh, um, we look at and, and host a whole, whole number of social events. I'm not entirely sure what social event that is, However, it is there to depict a social event. It's also a very politically correct slide as well, for those that might have noticed that. Okay, so getting active with the IMACI, again, this is generally sort of aimed at, at younger people, and as I, as I cast my eye around the audience, apart from a few exceptions, um, they're particularly young. So th this is for you. Get active with IMACI, okay? How do we do that? How do you do that? Um, become an affiliate. If you're a student or you've just, just been a student, become an affiliate. Okay, I'm not going to go into the where's and why for's and how to do this because I haven't got too much time, but please again just have a look at the website and the processes there. Okay, and it's actually free if you're a student as well, there's always a bonus. Um, Join a young member group um, here, uh, the young members are, are pretty well active. And if you have a look at, there's a, there's a section again on the website, I may have mentioned the website, uh, it's imeki.org. Have a look at that, it's, it's a section called Near You, and on there is a whole <coughs> host of events, a whole host of things you can get involved in, with in various divisions. Okay, uh, join at events, as I say, meet with fellow engineers and future employers. It may not be wholly relevant right now to some people, but it certainly will be at some point. Share an experience, that's always a good one. Uh, help to build your knowledge and support others, and also build soft professional skills. Okay. Yeah, there's a picture of a library, um, and this is about library and online resources. It is, if anybody gets the chance actually to go down to Birdcage Walk, which is where we're based, now for those that, that, that don't know, it's actually an extremely nice building, uh, an extremely nice room, it's all wood panelled, uh, and, and it's, it's a massive library, it's full of excellent resources, 
A lot of them can actually be downloaded for free, whereas usually you pay quite substantial amounts of money. Um, as I say, just, just have a look at that. Access to thousands of books and journals, as, as one would expect. And probably quite key, assistance with college and company projects as well. Uh, PE app, professional engineer, keeping up with engineering and emerging technologies. Always worth a look at that as well. It's also <coughs> downloadable. You've guessed it on the website, imeki.org, just in case anybody hasn't got that. Um, Engineers Interactive Data Book. Okay, we actually used to give these out as a physical book, uh, but due to austerity measures now, it's actually uh, downloadable and, and it's an app. Okay, it's exactly the same thing. Um, when you become an affiliate, and not that I'm trying to suggest that you become an affiliate, well, actually, I really am. Um, when you become an affiliate, you can actually download this for free. Okay, it's exceptionally useful. Take, take my word for that. Okay, um, here's some people getting some, well, you guessed it, some career support. Okay, often overlooked, this actually, I won't spend too much time on this, but this is actually quite a useful thing for my Mackie. Um, there's a little bit more, again, what, that, what I'm trying to do is lead you to the website. Uh, industry information, and these are really good, the engineers' video profiles, okay, they're quite varied. Uh, do please have a look at those, uh, and you'll get an idea of, of what you may well be doing at some stage. Careers advice, again, and job application search advice. Okay, various student com uh, competitions. Uh, not so easy for me to say, obviously. Railway challenge, um, formula student, which is the one that most people are aware of. Um, again, if you have a look at that on the website, it's really quite interesting stuff that goes behind that. And if you can become involved in that, you know, it's, it's, it's a worthwhile thing to do. Okay, um, yeah, I'm not gonna talk too much about that. There's also a support network, okay? And this is for basically people that may have, and I'm not suggesting that anybody does, um, may have various issues or may, may need some extra support. I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, this is basically at any stage of the career, so beginning, middle or end. Again, if you have a look on the website, and it's, all I'm going to say is it's quite an underutilised fund. I'll leave it at that. Now, the main bit of the presentation, I guess. Well, that's more of a little bit of a preamble into what maybe some of the, the soft benefits, if, if you will, are. So, professional registration. Okay, I'll leave it on there. Uh, nine minutes. Nine minutes. Nine minutes in or nine minutes left? Nine minutes left. Nine minutes left. Okay. Levels of professional registration. So we can start off as student members as an affiliate, as I've already touched on before. And if I haven't already mentioned this, we have a data app. Okay? I think I already have. I'm just trying to reinforce that. Um, you then look at becoming an associate. And then the main sort of part of joining IMACI, Institutional Mechanical Engineers. Um, EngTech. ING, Incorporated Engineer, or Chartered Engineer. Those are the, the main three levels. Once you've acquired one of those, and after a, a number of years' experience, you can then look at becoming a fellow as well. So, okay, I can spend quite a lot of time on this, um, but I'll, I'll spare you today. We've got, as I say, three main sections. So if you look actually in the boxes there, underneath each one, I would imagine that most people here uh, might be a couple that would be looking at Eng Tech, Engineering Technician. Um, predominantly, I would imagine here in this audience, we're looking at either ING or CENG. So, ING, you're looking at a bachelor's level qualification to become an, an incorporated engineer. Uh, and for a chartered engineer, you're now looking at a master's level qualification. That's just, there's essentially, and I can go into this in quite a lot of detail if anybody afterwards would, would like me to, um, you're looking, this, this part of it is the academics, the second part of it is you're looking at knowledge and understanding, and that will be gained through experience of becoming an engineer. And when you've generally got around about four years experience, you can look at applying for either ING or CENG. Okay, there's probably some really important words, may not be applicable to everybody here, but experience, if you don't have the academics, experience can count in lieu of qualifications as well. I won't spend too much time on that. Okay, so what are the first steps? What are the benefits? I sometimes wonder if I should talk about this first, but I've, I've left it till now. Um, if you don't remember anything else about today, okay, please just take one thing away from me. And all I'm going to say and ask you to remember is recognition of your competence. I cannot stress that enough. Okay, and just to qualify that a little bit, and this is a bit of a bugbearer of mine. 
Um, engineering in this country is not a protected term. You'll find that in other countries, I'll just take Germany as an example, it is a protected term. You cannot call yourself an engineer until you have a professional level of registration. Unfortunately, and again, it is just my interpretation, not my Mackey's, um, anybody who isn't an engineer can go and get a van and stick the word engineer on the side of it and go and fix some washing machines. Okay? That is not an engineer. Okay? And if there's anybody here that has friends who do go and fix washing machines, I'm not trying to be offensive. But what this is about is recognition of your competence. It's recognition by your peers. Another one of those, you can basically look at career enhancement. There are now, I won't say who they are, but there are a number of companies, uh, I was there the other week, um, and basically you can't move up uh, the career ladder, and you cannot progress unless you're professionally registered. Whether that be ING or CENG actually doesn't matter, they just want a level of professional registration. Ongoing development, being part of a professional institution as well, uh, there are a number of them. Um, gain access to lifelong learning from the IMECE and look at having professional credentials, so i.e. post-nominals, letters after you make. Okay, if, if there is anybody here that wants to apply as an affiliate, uh, this is where you go, oddly enough it's on the website, imeki.org, straight uni. Um, there's a form, you can basically do it paper-based. Um, this, this is just how to apply, it's, it's fairly, I'll just give you two seconds to look over that, it's fairly straightforward. That's how you do it. That's kind of it. Okay. <laughs> I'll, uh, just, just very, very quickly, and I know I'm probably not really supposed to do this. Are there any burning questions that anybody has about how to become registered, why they feel they should join my Um Okay, far away. On the detail of being a chartered and chartered engineer, is the master's postgraduate or undergraduate? So you, have to so you need a master's to become a chartered engineer. Do you need a postgraduate master's or an undergraduate master's? It can be either. It can be either. I'll talk to you afterwards about that. Okay, there's lots of sort of rules and regulations around that, but I can talk to you about that. Okay. Okay. okay, that's very much. Thank you, Dean. Uh, good afternoon, guys. Oh, and I forgot as well, sorry. And now I'll hand over to Nick and we'll talk all about blood hand. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers, Dean. Right, blood hand. I presume that most of you have heard of blood hand. Hands up if you have. Yeah, I hope so. Good. So, what are we all about? What are we trying to achieve? We're trying to break our own land speed record. But blood hand is a two pronged attack. Primarily, it's for um, breaking the land speed record. We currently stand at 763 miles an hour. We're trying to attain over 1,000 miles an hour. That's only one reason why we're doing this. One of the most important reasons why we're doing this is to engage with young people at school level of years sort of like five, six, seven, sort of nine, ten, eleven year olds, to encourage them to look at science, technology, engineering, and maths as a possible career pathway. I'm sure that we'll all know in this room that the engineers are hard to come by. Right? Good qualifications, good, good ethos. We're not producing enough engineers in this country. We need 120,000 engineers, graduate engineers, per annum to reach our target by 2020. We're currently getting around 35,000. That's leaving us a massive hole. And if we need to keep up in the um, international engineering um, community, then we need to recruit these young people. We're currently 7th, 8th in the world of uh, engineering exploitation, but high end. You know, we don't, do, um, we don't do toys to put in Happy Meal bags, but what we do is good stuff. Right, so let's get back to the last speed record. Let's get back to the last speed record and where did it all start and why are we doing this? I'm going to show you now an iconic land speed record card at the cutting edge of technology, using the best science, technology, engineering and maths to achieve the goal. There you go. What do you think of that? That was the first land speed record car, 39.24 miles an hour. Right, but this had two fundamental flaws. First of all, it was powered by electricity. Electric cars don't work. If you want to do more than 100 miles in one go, 
You've had it. And the second major flaw with this, it was French, and they can't build cars. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, uh, within five years, a quantum leap in technology for its day went from 39.24 miles an hour to break the 100 miles an hour. Quantum leap in technology. Time moves even further on, and we have here um, something that probably some of us will recognise, Bluebird. Beautiful car. But then we got to an area where reciprocating engines could only get us to a certain speed. So we needed to use a different sort of power. So we changed from a driven power into thrust. This one had a major flaw. Although it got the land speed record, it had a major flaw. This one as well. It was rocket powered, but it was American. <laughs> and they shouldn't have the land speed record because it belongs here in Great Britain. So we had to do something about it. So, my friend and colleague, Richard Noble, thought, I'm going to get hold of this. And so he got a, he got a jet engine. He's not an engineer. Richard's not an engineer. By his own admission, he's not an engineer. But what he is, is, an, is a <coughs> chance, a sort of explorer, if you like, into the unknown. Got himself a jet engine, stuck it on a chassis. Thought, jets are quick, so that'll make my car quick. He put the front end of probably looked something that looks like an old Formula 1 racing car on his car. Well, that's pretty quick, so that'll make my car go quick. He put some canard wings on it. Don't know what for, but they look good and they're on racing cars. So that's going to make my car go really good. So, do you think Richard got the land speed record with this car? Hmm, let's have a quick look, shall we? No. <laughs> 140 mile an hour, he decided to capsize it. Threw it down the runway, but walked away with two fundamental things. It was really, really good. He walked away with his life, which was good. It's a bonus. And he also walked away with the knowledge and experience to understand that he needed some help in this matter. He needed some special type of people. He needed some engineers. Now, I'll just tell you, this is the truth. Right? I go out to schools and colleges. Right? And I teach a lot of kids about this big and so forth, and so further up. And I, I normally ask a question, because some of these guys don't know what an engineer is. So I ask them, first of all, what is an engineer? And then I go and say, who's the most famous engineer that you can think of in the whole wide world? And this is the truth, right? One kid put his hand up and said to me, I said, yes, who do you think is the most famous engineer that you can think of in the whole wide world? It's Kevin from Coronation Street. <laughs> That's funny, but it's scary. It really is. The perception of what engineering is out there is bad. Because they just think, correctly point out, men washing machines, that sort of thing. They don't actually understand the intricacies of it. And when I turn around to kids and say what engineering is all about, I liken it to a chocolate orange. You know, the whole... The whole orange is encapsulated there inside the paper, but you can tap it, unwrap it, and all those different facets of engineering are all contained within one, uh, one thing. Right, let's move on. So Richard got himself a whole bunch of engineers and bought this thing. Um, thrust 2. We all know what I'm to thrust 1. This car he built, very heavy car. Got a spay engine in it. You can see it got a gaping hole at the front for the air intake. Um, and he run it down the desert and got up to a massive 633 miles an hour. To put that into context though, 633 <coughs> miles an hour, if we're travelling on an aeroplane, we're probably travelling around 550 miles an hour, high altitude, thin air, nice and easy. But on the ground it's a much, much different story. But anyway, he successfully built this car, successfully retained the record for, uh, for Great Britain, but we realised that we couldn't just sit on our laurels and just lay, lay back and they say, how fantastic are we, because somebody come along and take it. We didn't want that, so we had to do something about it. So we built this, Thrust SSC, supersonic car. So, how did we do this? We got two Rolls-Royce engines, spray engines, put them into this car, a very heavy car, but about a hundred, just, just short of 100,000 horsepower, but we've got this car up to 763 miles an hour, Mach 1.02, that's a massive leap. 
We'll be talking about why that's such a massive leap in a few minutes. But let me show you this. This is actually a piece of, this is a bit of footage that we took when we actually broke the record. You can't see the car at the moment. It's covered by the curvature of the earth. You can see the dust trail it's leaving. The video's stalled. No, it hasn't. That's on yours, not on mine. And I'll go back a slide and try and open it again. Hopefully it should come up. It's frozen, sorry. Not come up on yours. Do apologise for that. Does anybody here know about IT? My job. It's your job. It's frozen up now, mate. Sorry. You had it. It was on before. Yeah. Yeah, where are we? Right there. Uh... Okay. Brilliant. Really? Right. 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 right, this car's coming through. You can't hear anything at the moment because the car's actually travelling faster than the sound that it's making. So as it's coming into view here, you can see we're waiting for the sound to catch up. achieve with blood hand. That sonic boom, or pressure wave if you like, create, created this massive noise. The pressure wave could be heard over 40 miles away. The boom could be heard over 40 miles away. And in a little town called Gallic, about 15 miles away just off the desert, <coughs> um, the kids were all in school and that shock wave hit, set all the sprinklers off in the school and all the kids got soaking wet. They weren't very happy with that, but we were because we'd just broke the land speed record and broken the sound barrier. So we're going to be building a car. We're going to be building a car to a thousand miles an hour. We can't use, we can't get hold of a wind tunnel that give us the right data. So we're going to use the best technology that we can use at the moment, and that is computational fluid dynamics. You can see here where the pressures are mapped out. The high pressures being the red areas, the low pressures being blue areas. <laughs> However, we had, this is one of the early configurations you'll see by the tail fin there, because we had about 12 tonnes of lift on the back end of that car and only 7 tonnes of downforce, so effectively if we'd have launched that car, that car would have just taken off and thrown around like a rag doll. So we had to progressively use CFD to develop the, com uh, the configuration of which we're using. But this car's going to cost in the region of 40, no, about £64 million. Pounds. The construction. So what we're going to do, we're just going to go out there and build a car based upon computational fluid dynamics and say the computer says yeah. Or do we validate that information? And I would suggest if I was spending that sort of money, I would want some sort of validation. So how do we do that? How do we validate this? What we did, we built, uh, we built a model of um, thrust SSC. We packed it full of 18 strafing missile rockets sent it down a sled packed with uh, all the sensors that we needed uh, to get all the information off it to compare it against the CFD data. This is when we tested it. I suggest you don't blink for us after this. Uh, so does it run from slide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which one? From current slide? From current slide, yeah. <laughs> but it's just no, I, should, I, I know I should have put my laptop in. Oh, did you? No, I'm 
No, it's doing it on. No, it's not. Come on. Go back and slide then. Yeah, that's one. No, it's not playing ball. I think we might have to. We might have to leave that one. Yeah. No, I think we're going to have to leave that one. Okay. Fine. Still going. No, we're out of it, sorry. But this is depicts the, the, the car that we packed with 18 strafing missile rockets and four in retro. And we sent it down the track and it accelerated from zero to 800 miles an hour in 0.8 of a second. And the piece of video I wanted to show you there, well, you did see what Jenny always went zing, and that was it. Yeah, that generated 75G, so obviously it was a model and there's no driver in the car. But what we did, what we did, we, we, we retrieved the data from that. We also put it against the computational fluid dynamic data <laughs> and see if we could get par any parity to it. And we found out there was less than 4% deviation from the data that we received from the car to the computational fluid dynamics data. So therefore that gave us the confidence in going ahead and building the car based upon that CFD data. We'll have a problem with these uh, videos, I think. <coughs> it's locked out again. Not changing. Changing on here, but it's not changing on there. Right, I'll let this one speak for itself rather than not want to touch it. This is Ron Ayres and telling you why we've got the shape of Bloodhound. I'm sometimes asked whether we use mathematical optimization techniques to design Bloodhound. Well, it's a nice idea, but there are practical problems in doing so. For instance, if I draw a nice mathematical optimization of a minimum drag shape, I get something like that. But it's not a very practical shape. For instance, we need to accommodate jet engines and rocket engines. So I'll need to cut the back end off so that the uh, jet deflux and the rocket deflux can be accommodated. Now, the jet engine also needs an intake. So I need to modify the front end as well so that air can get in the front. And our driver, because he's driving at a thousand miles an hour, does insist that he's got to see where he's going. So I'd better accommodate him by putting a forward facing screen. This not only enables him to see, it has another advantage. The wedge shape there causes a shock wave which pre compresses the air going into the intake. Now, this surprisingly increases the efficiency of the intake, particularly at supersonic speeds. Indeed, at the maximum speed of Bloodhound, that shock wave will increase the thrust of the jet engine by some 10%. Now, another thing we have to bear in mind, we're not after the airspeed record, we're after the land speed record. So I'm going to draw the land in, and that means we need wheels as well, Now that introduces another problem. The air arriving from the front, a lot of it now gets squeezed under the nose and causes increasing pressure. And this, at the high speeds that we're going, will be quite sufficient to lift the front end of the car off the ground. So to counter that, I droop down the nose so it's much closer to the ground, so less air can get underneath more air hits the top of the nose, so the lifting force from underneath and the downforce on top balance each other out. The other problem we have is to ensure that the front end does stay in the front. For that we need a fin. So now we have the shape of Bloodhound, but it is nothing like the mathematical shape that we started with, purely because of practical considerations. So, by what Ron said, Bloodhound pretty much designs itself to a certain extent because we've got to incorporate the, uh, the engineering package inside it, so it's got to be of a certain length, it's got to be of a certain shape, 
uh, to get us up to a thousand miles an hour. Now those CFD calculations uh, have taken us over 50 man years of, um, or of research and development, or it would have taken that sort of time, to get the shape that we've got. We're really now on configuration 13, or the engineers like to call it 12A, because they're a little bit superstitious. Um, but we're ready to run now, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that in just a second. So we've got the shape of our car, so we need something to propel it, something to move it at 1,000 miles an hour. We've got one of these. This is an EJ200 Eurofighter engine. Top of its game. It's got a 9 to 1 power to, weight, power to thrust ratio, so it's given us 9 times its weight in thrust. And it's a cracking piece of engineering. Developed in this country by Rolls Royce and partners on, uh, on the continent, but primarily the design is from Rolls Royce. Um, this actually has got some very, very sort of, uh, it's got some quirks to it. The operating temperature inside the combustion chamber is in excess of the melting point of the material of which it's constructed. So effectively this engine should melt. The reason why it doesn't melt is because the way that they actually grow the crystal, uh, grow the uh, turbine blades, is through a crystal process. And they can get little holes inside the crystals, uh, holes inside the blades if you like, to get the air through that to dissipate the heat quickly enough so it doesn't compromise the molecular structure of the engine. We've got one of these in our car, that's going to develop 20,000 pounds of thrust. That's not enough to get us up to 1,000 miles an hour, so we need to uh, incorporate something else, but we'll have a look at that in a sec. This is where the, this is where the engine normally lives, in a Eurofighter Typhoon. The Eurofighter Typhoon has got two of these engines, we've only got one. Just like to have a look at this. If this piece of video plays, that'll be fantastic. <coughs> oh! That's my heart going. jet engine that was giving us a lot of power. Incidentally, the Euro, uh, the Euro fighter that was, obviously it was a cartoon, but uh, in that uh, race, 
The low altitude record in the world at the moment is 998 miles an hour, I believe. Yeah, 998 miles an hour. Uh, and that was from a diving aircraft coming from a forced dive and coming down and, and doing a measured mile. Right? So we're actually, if we get this 1,000 miles an hour, we'll be actually getting the low altitude record as well. So it'll be the fastest thing on the planet under 3,000 feet, air or land. That's why we need the help of a bit of a rocket going on there. This is NAMO. Uh, this is one of the prototype rockets that have been testing for us. Uh, we're looking at using a cluster of rockets up to five. We're thinking the first run we would do, which we'll talk about in a bit, we might not use a full five rocket system. Um, but NAMO, uh, come on board. We used to use a Falcon rocket system, but we couldn't get enough power out of that and it was too heavy, so we've looked at a little bit of higher technology and NAMO have come up with goods and they're working with us today. This is what we uh, initially used. NAMO is using a pretty much similar sort of thing to this. It's a hybrid rocket. And why are we using a hybrid rocket? If we could use a liquid rocket, we could have a liquid oxidizer and a liquid fuel. Mix those two together, we've got a rocket. But it's very, very unstable. You get the sort of valves wrong or something like that, that's exactly what happens to Challenger. We don't want that to happen. So liquid rockets are out there. We could use solid rockets, where the oxidizer is incorporated in the fuel grain. However, a bit like bonfire that rocket, you can't turn it off. So we needed to come up with something that we can have full throttle control over, but still give us a massive amount of power. <coughs> so we opted for a hybrid rocket system. Now this is quite a clever thing. It's not new technology, but we've perfected it. Um, on here, you can see at the end here, we've got the catalyst. All right, going through the room of the catalyst here, we've got a fuel grain. Now this fuel grain is uh, it's called hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene. I have a lot of fun when we're working with the kids to try and get to say that. <laughs> but it's basically man-made rubber. That's what we've used our solid fuel, and then we're going to put into the end of here some high test peroxide. The kids find it very funny if we're liking it to uh, hair bleach. So uh, that's what we're going to do. That's going to basically give us enough power in conjunction with the rocket to actually get this thing up to the power level that we need. Now the rocket, this you can see here is Coswell. Coswell's no, no longer part of uh, Bloodhound. We're now using uh, an association with Jaguar Land Rover. But we've got 650 horsepower fuel pump just for the rocket. Because we'll be using 1,000 litres of rocket fuel in about 17 to 19 seconds. So that's quite a big pump that we need. Um, that is, comes at a cost of around 10,000 quid a run. So we're going to burn that sort of fuel that sort of time. This is just testing the rocket. This is up the water power by the way. Catching my slides up here. So that was the rocket running at 25%. So if you can imagine, we've got an EJ200 Euro fighter engine running 20,000 pounds of thrust. We've also got this thing here kicking off. We've got, in combination, I know it's thrust, but we've been given the we've given the authority to convert that into an equivalent of brake horsepower. So in those two engines combined, we've got an equivalent of 135,000 horsepower. And so those of you that can remember uh, the QE2, that had 110,000 horsepower in the QE2. We've got 25,000 horsepower, more than that, in a seven and a half ton car, carrying one passenger. All right, so that puts it into some sort of perspective. When we were talking about the CFD earlier on, uh, and how we need to design this car to be as aerodynamic as possible, is because we need this amount of power to punch through the air. Because the faster we go through the air, the more resistance we're going to get from the air. So like if you're going sort of slow speed, I'm sort of walking through the air, the air's getting out of my way. The faster I go, the faster the air's got to get out of the way. So when we get up to these sorts of speeds, it'd be like you swimming through treacle. So we need a massive amount of power to push us through there. Because the drag coefficient increases exponentially to the speed. So we need a lot more power just to get a little bit more speed. And that's why we're using all these awesome bits of kit. Catch myself up.
done it again, blamming that. That's it. Right, so to run this car, we need some wheels obviously. And these wheels have been specially designed because when these wheels are rotating, at 172 times a second, they're generating 50,000 radial G at the rim. So that would be the equivalent of having a two pound bag of sugar and that two pound bag of sugar weighing the same as a fully loaded Arctic lorry and tractor unit. This thing's trying to pull itself apart. And so these wheels have been specially designed. We're using um, forged aluminium, but not only are we using forged aluminium, we're doing something to it in, a, in a, uh, another way as well. Because when we've got the, the, the molecular structure of the aluminium, it's got dendrites in it like little sort of Christmas trees if you like. So we have to pound those out to make it nice and tight so we get the strength out of these aluminium wheels. And you can also see there's a ridge on there. That ridge is for a purpose because when we go out in the desert, and I'm going to talk about the desert in a minute, uh, that digs into the desert floor so it's going to give a little bit of lateral stability as well while we get up to speed. Right, so we've got up to a thousand miles an hour. Let's just put it into perspective what a thousand miles an hour is. You know, it sounds a big number, that's great. But how would I get over to a six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old kid what a thousand miles an hour is? What I normally do is the analogy of if I put a football pitch down there end to end, and I put five football pitches all end to end, the car would cover all those five football pitches in one second. So that's pretty quick. So we've got up to a thousand miles an hour, we've gone through the measured mile. We've got five miles to stop this thing. So how do we actually do that? <coughs> how do we stop it? Anybody got a clue? Flaps. Right. Sorry? Uh, flaps. flaps. Yeah? <coughs> when we turn those taps off, when we turn those engines off, we talked about CFD, when, we, when the air is our enemy to get us up to a thousand miles an hour, now it becomes our friend. Because when we turn these taps off, we've got 15 tons of drag on the nose end of this car. That's going to slow us down at the rate of 64 miles an hour per second per second. So Andy, if you imagine, if full, full taps open, right? Go as fast as you can, you're going to have about 2.8 G on it. And then suddenly when he turns everything off, he's gone from there to there, right? He's going to have about 3 negative. So he's going to get thrown like a rat, like a rat, like a rat dog. We're still going to have to make those split second decisions. And that, te that takes an awful lot of brains and courage, I have to say. So, what do we do first? Well, we use the first, is the first, uh, is the uh, natural coefficient to drag on the car. Secondly, yeah, we bring the flaps in, we bring the air brakes in. Um, they slow us down, they increase our signature through the air, creating more drag, creating a, more, a better braking si uh, situation. Then when we get down to about 600 miles an hour, we can get, use the parachutes, again increasing our signature, again increasing our, our deceleration rate. And then finally, we're going to use uh, some disc brakes, a little bit larger than them. <laughs> so, what is it? that's how we're going to get down to 1,000 miles an hour. But don't forget, that's only half the journey. We've then got to turn this car around. <coughs> we've burnt the solid fuel out of the rockets, so we're going to change the rockets. We've got to put the fuel back into the car. We've got to check the wheels. And we've got to go down that measured mile again within one hour. So the changeover process and the turnaround process is a major and fundamental part of the team operation. We've got one of our lady engineers heads that team up and she's got it down now to about, um, we could do the running around sort of, 10 seconds to spare, it's that tight. So, you know, when we did thrust SSC, we actually went faster than 763 miles an hour on one double run, but we missed the time slot by 17 seconds, so it didn't count. So the black speed record would have been even more. Doesn't like me, does it, this? So we can then boast now, we've got a car that's capable of 1,000 miles an hour, for stable from zero to 1,000, and a thousand back down to zero. We've changed the configurations on it quite considerably, so we're happy with that. So where are we going to take this thing? 
Take on the M62 probably. <laughs> nah, not really. So let's have a look, where can we go? We had a look all over the world. Several places we found, quite a lot of places we found. Um, there, was, there was one in Libya, a bit politically unstable, not really too happy about that. So we sort of kept looking around. Um, and there was a fantastic place in Argentina. But unfortunately they didn't want us to go there for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to settle for the next best thing, which was South Africa. We first had a look at a place called the Vinutan, uh, but Andy Green, the driver, felt that that wasn't quite suitable. And before he kept, got on the plane home, the um, South African government said, no, have a look at this other place first, before you go, because we're really, really keen for you to be on board with this in our country. So that's what they did. They showed you the Haskin Pan. Now this is a fantastic place, between Botswana and Namibia, right on the edge of the Kalahari Desert there. But what it also gives us the opportunity to do is use Uppington, as you can see, to the south of that, which is a major uh, city for the area. It's also got a very, very long runway, so it gives the ability to land the Antonov aircraft that we're taking Bloodhound out in on that tarmac, and then we can then vehicle transport it up to the Hackskin Pan. But what it also gives us is the opportunity to use their engineering prowess, because they do a lot of engineering for the Northern Cape mines, diamond mines, gold mines, that sort of thing. So we've got the engineering expertise there for us to pull on if we need to. This is what the uh, hat scheme pan looks like if you Google it. Um, it's a play of desert, so it's basically it's a mud desert. It's bounded by rocks. If I overlay the track here, as you can see, we're using all of it. We've got to get our sums right. We can't have Andy overshooting, because otherwise it'll just end up into the rocks and that's not a good thing. So, this is the Playa Desert, right? It's dried out lake bed basically. Uh, gives them fantastically flat surface, and that, give, that comes by a natural process. So, how can we find such a level place that nature can provide for us year on year? Well, what happens is it floods during the rainy season, like this, disturbs all that material. A little bit like if you've got a, a, a sort of handful of soil, put it in a jam jar, put some water in it, shook it up. On the side you've got muddy water, come back a couple of weeks later, it's all sedimented. And that's what's happening here. Natural sedimentation, and then the sun will come out, dry it all out, and provide us with a lovely flat surface. These guys here, um, contrary to popular belief, not making sand castles, but what they are doing is picking up uh, the little rocks, because we have to pick up anything bigger than a peanut, and we need to do it by hand. The reason why we need to do it by hand is because we can't start putting heavy machinery on there, because that will disturb, disturb the natural surface, and that's going to be counterproductive to what we want. So, these guys have been shifting, um, over the last four years, 16,500 tonnes of material by hand. Now that's a world record in itself. Um, you wouldn't have thought that was a very, very good job. They love it. I mean, if you look on the horizon there, can you see any infrastructure there? There's no opportunity for employment. Those guys don't work, they don't get paid, they don't get paid, they don't eat. So they love us. And out there in the desert before we got there, the kids were basically just going to a mud hut for a school. Now that school's got full electricity and full uh, 4G signal, because we've got to put the 4G mast out there as well. So where I live in Conisborough, I can just about get GPRS, they've got 4G in the middle of the desert. So we're not right there. <laughs> uh, so they're very happy. We brought a lot of stuff to them. We're making this uh, surface so that they can use it year on year, possibly for um, land sailors racing, because it gets windy at night time, so they might use it for that, they might use it for motorcycle, they might use it for anything that they could do. So that's enhancing their community, that's enhancing their uh, local economy. So we're leaving a legacy as well. Where we are now with the building process. The process of building, a bit further on than this, uh, this was uh, uh, taken a, a little while ago, uh, but you can see the, ca the car starting to form its shape. The cockpit here, where we're using a carbon fibre composite um, at the front. Then we've got the hatch there where Andy gets in and out. And we've got uh, titanium ribs down the side there with a solid steel pan. 
Because underneath it needs to be solid steel, because that's going to take an awful lot of pounding from the, uh, the dust that's being thrown up on, on, the, uh, on the run. We are currently um, progressing. We were down at Canary Wharf just later on last year, where we presented the car to the public. Um, it was in its full shell. The EJ200 Euro fighter was in it, and it was 95% in completion. We're now just waiting for the uh, rocket motor to be delivered from Nano, and then we'll be ready for testing this year down at Newquay, where we'll just do a mono test uh, with the jet engine alone to about 200 miles an hour, 250 miles an hour. And um, once we've proved that, once we've proved all the systems, then we'll take it back out to South Africa and run it up to 850 miles an hour. <coughs> This is the Aero Hub where we're going to be testing it to 250. And this is an overview of the whole project. This is Bloodhound SSC, the most extraordinary and complex racing car ever designed. Built in the UK by a team of Formula One and aerospace experts, it aims to inspire kids about science, technology, engineering and maths by reaching 1,000 miles per hour. Bloodhound is a battle with physics, a journey into the unknown. A jet from a typhoon fighter, a rocket hotter than a volcano, huge metal wheels spinning 170 times a second. With the equivalent of 135,000 horsepower, Bloodhound will cover a mile in just 3.6 seconds, faster than a bullet. The car is being built now. In 2015, it will be on the Hapskin Pound in South Africa's Northern Cape, where a team of 300 people have moved 6,000 tons of rocks by hand to create a smooth 12-mile race course on a dry lake bed. Driver Andy Green's first target will be in a new record of 800 miles per hour. We'll return in 2016 for the push to 1,000. Followed in 220 countries, we're sharing every detail. Ambassadors are visiting schools, and children are setting up their own science clubs. Be part of the adventure. Join the 1K Club. Get your school involved. Follow the action every day online and on Twitter. Bloodhound is coming. I'd just like to point out the timeline that was explained there, being going back out in 2016 for the 1,000 miles an hour run. Yes, we have hit a few obstacles, uh, primarily uh, financial. Um, I don't mean that the project's not going, it is going on now, but because of the downturn in uh, global economy, um, a lot of our sponsors have been tightening the purse strings and uh, you know, we've found it more difficult to attract money in uh, to get this car. Because not only when we, once we've built this car, we've got to transport it out to, the, uh, out to uh, South Africa, We've got massive fuel costs, this, that and the other, and we need obviously to have that, have that funding in place to utilise that when we get out there. So that's one of the reasons why the project has been sort of stalling, if you like, over the last couple of years. But we've just, I can't actually tell you who it is, but we've just come up with some major sponsors uh, that's just pretty much on board, um, and they will take us right through to, uh, to the end of the project. Uh, fully funded, so we're quite quite excited about that. Hopefully, I've given you a bit of a, uh, an overview of what the project's all about. Um, but I can't can't affirm enough that that uh, we really are wanting to get involved with young people. Now, a student gives you an opportunity to go into Bloodhound's website and uh, click on um, ambassadors. Would give you the opportunity if we were working, let's say, in a local school or something of that ilk. Then, if you were a Bloodhound ambassador, you could then come along with one of the team members and assisters giving sort of young people um, a taste of science, technology, engineering and maths by doing practical workshops, that sort of thing. So if you want it, if that's interesting to you, obviously it looks pretty good on the CV as well, so just check out the website for that. Um, that's pretty much what I've got to say at the moment. Has anybody got any questions? Yes, sir, Matt. What's the future intention of over sixty million pound of investment? Sorry? The future intention of the whole project. So let's given the sixty million pounds, yeah, okay. Uh, let's just and, put this and, and of the 
share you would overcome with this challenge? So you would travel a thousand miles per hour, but then what can we use in terms of technology from it? What can we do with it? Okay, that's a very good question. I'll give you the answer to that. Bloodhound is effectively a rolling laboratory. Right? We're using new techniques. I mean, the steering wheel itself is made out of uh, 3D printing in titanium. So we're pushing the envelope with uh, new ideas, new products, new techniques, um, right through all our materials. And, and, and we're using some fantastic adhesives, basically, we're gluing the thing together. You know, you would have thought it's a bit, a bit more than Boston, but certainly it's industrial standard stuff. So there's a whole, lo whole list of stuff that we're using. And plus, let's put it this way, 64 million pounds. What can you go out and buy for 64 million pounds? You can, you can get a Premier League football player for probably six months a year, right? Fantastic. Right, you can go out and um, you can run a Formula One racing car team for three meetings. Brilliant. Or you can use Bloodhound to inspire the next generation of young people to look at science, technology, engineering and maths and to embrace the technology rather than fighting it and hopefully breed new scientists, engineers that we can use to go to take this country forward and maintain our position within the world's economy. That's what we're going to spend the £64 million on. Yes, sir? Um, what, if anything, is the next ambition after the 1K record? Well, I've got it on good authority that um, Richard will be getting his smoking jacket, pipe and slippers out, because he's, he's, he's about had enough of it now. Andy Green, uh, he reckons he's sort of about had enough of it now, uh, but would like to look at... There has been banter about, it is banter, that we're possibly looking at uh, probably Mach 2. Because we've got about Mach 1.4 now, so we're looking probably as that as the next boundary. But given the technology that we've got available to us today, that's far beyond where we've got at the moment. So, you know, just let's take one step at a time, really. Yes, sir. Uh, what are the greatest safety challenges you face uh, for the driver? I assume that you've identified yeah. hazards and how have you mitigated against? Well, let's put it this way if he crashes at 1,000 miles or he's dead. Uh, um, in, all honest, in all honesty, we've got a carbon fibre uh, cell that he's, that's, he's in, it's got its own fire suppression system in there, and he's as safe as we can make him. The car itself is the safest we can make it. It's got automatic uh, fail to safe devices on it. So if there's an issue with the engines or anything like that, it just shuts itself down. You know? So those are sort of issues. Nobody said, right, that it wasn't dangerous. You know, how many people have been killed climbing Everest? Yeah? How many people have been killed at sea trying to race around the around we as human beings, if we didn't push the envelope of science and technology, we'd still be living in caves. And comes when you're pushing something, you're gonna take a bit of a risk. But to make this achievement, then yeah, there are risks, but acceptable as we can make them. Yeah. When is Bloodhound expected to come to fruition? When are you planning to actually go for the test? Um, well, the test will be this, this year down in New Key for 200 mile an hour. When the weather window opens in March, we saw it was flooded out there, so that will be coming back into um, usable state in March of next year, which will take the car out 800 and 850 mile an hour, breaking the land speed record, then bring it back home here and then we'll be in a position then to take it back later once we've got all the telemetry from the car and we can understand because not only we're we breaking the sound barrier we're going into somewhere where we've never been before we've got subsonic air where we're here now we've got transonic air which is obviously transonic we've supersonic and then you've got hypersonic we're going to go into the region of hypersonic air we've never been there before we don't know what it's all about so we're just basically going to tip, dip his toe in the water at 850 mile an hour, get all that telemetry, we can find out how that's acting upon the car, and so that we can make any adjustments necessary to take us right through up to 1,000 miles an hour. Anything else? Just going once, <laughs> go twice, all done, solved.